Welcome to Your Mac Life for Wednesday, March the 30th, 2016. This is show number 1085. Thank you guys very much for joining me here on the show. I'm your host, Sean King. Um, as always, send us emails on air at yourmaclifeshow.com during the show if you want me to see or read them during the show or during the week to sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. Love getting emails from you guys, whether it's during the show or whether it is during the week. Tonight we're going to talk to our good friend Jim Dalrymple of The Loop at loopinsight.com, as always. We're going to talk about the FBI versus Apple. It's not over. Do not think in any way, shape, or form that it's over. It's not. Not by a long shot. We'll also talk to Jim about his two reviews. Uh, he re- he's re- posted reviews on Loop Insight for the iPhone SE and for the new 9.7-inch iPad Pro. He's been using those since uh, the Apple announcements last week. We'll talk to him about his opinions about those two new devices. If you have any questions for Jim, again, send them to me on air at yourmaclifeshow.com. I'll do my best to get them on during the live portion of our show. Also, in our starting point photography segment, we're going to talk about an aspect, <clears throat> the, the aspect of photography that I find the most interesting for me personally. It's the idea that it satisfies both the technical nerdy aspect of my personality, which is not as nerdy as a lot of you folks, Uh, but also the creative side. And I'll talk about that um, because I'm going out this weekend to a place here in Vancouver, uh, just outside of Vancouver, called Brandywine Falls. And I'll explain why later on in the show in the starting point photography segment. A lot of you guys know that I ride a motorcycle, and I love riding a motorcycle. Yesterday I went out... um, you know I lose stuff all the time. You know I'm an idiot. Saturday I did a photo critique class downtown Vancouver and somehow managed to leave behind the power cable for my MacBook Pro. So next day I call up the restaurant and say, hey, I left this power cable there. Yeah, did you guys find it? No. What do you mean no? No one turned in. This, it wasn't like it was a wallet. It wasn't a diamond ring. It was a power cable. How could someone not have turned it in? So I had to go buy a new frickin' power cable for my laptop. <clears throat> hundred bucks. Hundred bucks I don't have, can't afford, but I need because I got to power the laptop. So I went out on uh, to the Apple Store. Now, this is as I said yesterday in in Twitter, uh, on on Twitter and on uh, the Telegram IRC chat room. The difference between a car driver and a motorcycle rider. A car driver would have seen where the Apple Store was, in this case it's Coquitlam, noticed that it was 60 kilometers or 40 miles away, gotten in the car, and driven straight there. Would have taken about 40, 45 minutes. Well, as a motorcycle rider, I see where the Apple Store is, and I think, what's the longest distance I can do to get there? (laughs) How can I have the most fun possible? And the most fun is not in a straight line. So rather than go 60 miles, 60 kilometers, 40 miles, and take 40, 45 minutes to get there, I took a 130-kilometer trip, an 80-mile trip around <laughs> the back roads. It took me an hour and a half. I actually, it took me 100 minutes, hour, hour and 40 minutes to get there, and loved it. Loved it. There's a, a portion of it that I do on the interstate, and our, our interstate, Trans-Canada Highway. And... When's the last time in your car you were in a near accident? you remember? I do. It was yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before. I am in a near accident, and how I define a near accident is if I didn't do something to prevent it, I'd be on the ground. That's what I call a near accident. I'm in a near accident almost every single day I ride. Sometimes multiple times a day. It was three times on Saturday, driving into Vancouver. 25% of the time, it's from distracted driving. It's from someone who changes lanes without looking over their shoulder because they're distracted by someone in the car, the kids in the back seat, or quite often, by a cell phone. They're reading text, or they're answering text, or they're doing something on their cell phone. I pass through all the time. I look over, and they're texting on the highway at 60, 70 miles an hour with other traffic around them. 
<clears throat> I saw this stat on the news uh, yesterday, over the weekend. Vancouver Police Department issued 1,600 distracted driving tickets in March alone. And generally, police feel they catch about 1% to 5% of the people who are doing the thing that they're trying to catch them on. So this is only 1% to 5% of the people in March. And you know the numbers are higher than that. The best part about this story is this. I love this picture. And I'll blow it up so you, so, so you guys can see it. This is the police in North Vancouver with their, oh, come on, go away. With their eye in the sky, the, the the police are in a cherry picker. Let me get that rid of that thing. Yeah, and open, open. Uh, 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 can open the picture in a different window. Oh, for Christ's sake! Anyway, so so the police. This is not a marked van or anything. This is <coughs> this is a cop with obviously a pair of binoculars, watching up the up the road for distracted drivers. DH says, Sean needs a GoPro dashboard cam for the bike. Dude, a door, GoPro dashboard cam isn't going to do me a damn bit of good preventing an accident. It would be utterly useless. Completely pointless. The other story I saw of the police um, capturing or nailing people for distracted driving was out in, um, I believe it's... Uh, Delta? I think it was Delta. Let me see if I can't find where, where, Where'd the story go? Ah, I lost the story. Oh, come on. The uh, Delta is a suburb of Vancouver, and the police uh, will often, you know, stand by the side of the road and try to catch folks who are doing that bad thing, you know, whatever whatever that bad thing might have been. Well, it turns out last March on, obviously, St. Patrick's Day, the Delta police were at the side of the road with a cop dressed as a leprechaun. <laughs> he was standing there catching people who were distracted driving in a leprechaun outfit. I love that. That is hilarious. Hilarious. Because you, you, you wouldn't really pay much. You should be paying attention. You shouldn't notice a leprechaun. But they weren't. Now, the other thing that was interesting was, uh, thanks to Sherry and Wayne who pointed this out, um, $167 here in British Columbia for distracted driving. But look at the other charges. It's $500 in Ontario for first offense for distracted driving. It's only $115 in Quebec, only $100 in Newfoundland, but $500 also in Prince Edward Island for the first offense. This is good. I, I want to see these kinds of things because distracted driving kills hundreds and hundreds of people. As a motorcyclist, I'm never going to get caught for distracted driving, at least not texting. <clears throat> but... We get affected by it a lot. So I'm constantly trying to keep people aware of the fact, please don't do this. As the summer, as you guys can see, it's it's 20 degrees here in Vancouver, here in late March. It's beautiful. And there's going to be a lot more folks like me on motorcycles and scooters and bicycles on the streets of the city. And all it takes is the slightest bump from a car a bump that you wouldn't even notice in your car. You might think you hit a speed bump and look behind you and a motorcyclist or a scooter or a bicycle is down, possibly dead, because you weren't paying attention and you ran them over. There is nothing that is so important on your phone that you need to look at it while you're driving. Nothing. Nothing. Doesn't matter what it is. Nothing is so important that your phone buzzes and you need to pick it up while you're driving and look at it. Every motorcyclist will tell you horror stories of simple things like they're at a stoplight and they're just sitting there 
and the person behind them runs into them because they were slowing down for the stoplight, and they figured, oh, I'm slowing down. I'm not going very fast. I'll start reading my phone. Well, they didn't see the motorcycle. They saw the car in front of the motorcycle, but they, they're blind to the motorcycle. A friend of mine, not a friend of mine, but a guy I know online, just bought his FJR, the same kind of bike that I have. He had 100 miles on it. The tires weren't even scrubbed in. That's exactly what happened to him. Totaled his bike. He's okay. He's fine. But it totaled his motorcycle because the person was reading their, their text messages, going through their phone, while slowly coming up the traffic, and they hit him. Wayne says, even attentive drivers often don't see cyclists or motorcyclists. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, a, it's hard enough being a bicyclist, a scooter rider, anything on two wheels, with attentive drivers, let alone inattentive ones. So I'm trying to encourage folks, please, as, as, as the season goes on, as it gets warmer out there, you're going to see more and more folks on two wheels enjoying their lives. Don't ruin it for them. Don't ruin their life and your life. Imagine how bad you'd feel if you hit somebody because you were checking a text message. And the text message was, bring home milk. The text message was, are you going to be home soon? And you hurt someone or killed somebody just because you had to read that text message. Put the phone away. When you get in the car, put the phone away. <clears throat> Unless you're using it for navigation, keep it in your pocket. Don't take it out. Let it buzz. Let it beep. Let it boop. Let it do whatever it's doing. When you get to your destination, then you can pull it out and look. Happens to me all the time. I'm riding around. I've, 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 I'll have my cell phone, in my iPhone in my chest pocket. And I'm riding around. I, I feel it vibrating. I'm not going to answer it. Obviously, I can't answer it. But that's the way you should be, too. Don't answer the phone. It's not that important. DJ McIntyre says, since I work walk everywhere, I find drivers don't even think about pedestrians. Absolutely. The, 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 the thing is, um, when you're in a car, you feel like you're in a bubble, and you forget about the world around you. We see that all the time. People think they're invul inv invincible in a car, invulnerable in a car. They'll do things in a car they would never do walking. I've had people act very, very aggressively towards me on, on a motorcycle because they're in a car. But, yeah, you tend to just ignore the outside world, and it's, it can be dangerous. It is dangerous. Lots and lots of people have been hurt and killed from distracted driving, so please don't, uh, don't be that person. Later on in the show, we're going to talk to, uh, sorry, we're going to talk about uh, the technical versus creative aspects of photography. My favorite reason for being a photographer is these two, balancing these two things. We'll talk about how and why a little later on in the show. Next up, though, we're going to talk to a good friend, Jim Downpo from The Loop at loopinsight.com about his two reviews for the iPhone SE and the new uh, iPad Pro, and also about the FBI versus Apple. It ain't over, kids. All that and hopefully much, much more coming up. This is your Mac Life.
Welcome back, folks. This is Your Mac Life. I am Sean King, joined in our phone room by our good friend from under the bridge, Jim Downpool of the Loop at loopinsight.com. Jim, how you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good. Uh, so the uh, FBI versus Apple, everything is good. Everything's cool. It's cleared up. It's done. It's over, yeah. right? All, all, all great. I'll go. <laughs> That's right. They've all kissed and made up. They're going for breakfast tomorrow. That's right. No, no need to worry about a thing. No, it's only one phone. What's the big deal? Should yeah. w- What do you think Apple's worried about right now? Well, I mean, I, I don't know that Apple's really worried about anything, but we all know that uh, the FBI can wait for the most incendiary case they can possibly get. Um, sorry, sorry, Jim. You God have to, forbid Jim, that you have, the you, U.S. Jim, Jim, you have to back up. I, we missed all yeah. of that. So start from the beginning on that. The, you broke up oh. completely. Sorry. Oh. I, I don't know that Apple's worried about anything, really, but what the FBI is going to do is wait for a case. Uh, God forbid the U.S. gets hit by a terrorist attack like 9 11. Then, you know, it's going to be a tough sell for Apple if something like that happens. I believe that they'll stand their ground, but still it'll be a tough sell. So I think that's what's going to happen with the FBI. But we'll never or not, because if there was, they're going to want to let the people communicating with them know that they know. And if there wasn't, then they're they're going to go on through Jim, have you lost connectivity in, un, under the bridge? Are you moving around? Why? I, I can hear you. Yeah, but w- the audience can't hear you, and that's the important thing. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> I don't know what else to do. What do you want me to do? No, no I'm not just asking. Are, are you moving around? Are you sitting still? Are you uh, doing anything? I was moving around. Okay, sit down. Okay, hold on. i got to get a beer. <laughs> get a beer. You, we, we've been doing this for like 10 years at 545 on Pacific Time. You should have already had a beer in your hands. I did have a beer in my hand. I finished it. <laughs> See? Listen. <laughs> oh, careful, there. careful, careful. It just crashed against the other beers <laughs> that I had in my hand today. Uh, that's the that's the old joke, folks. How do you, how do you handcuff a Nova Scotian or give him two beers? Yeah, <laughs> done. We can't do a damn thing now. Okay, oh. so did you did you hear anything I said? Yeah, for the most part, I got, I got your point. The, the, but the yeah. question is, I think Apple should be worried about this. I think Apple is legitimately worried about what this exploit is and what it represents. Oh, oh, oh! I see, I see. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think Apple, Apple, if they were able to get in, which it, you know, if you believe all the rumors and reports and things like that, they did get in. Yep. And if you believe that, that means there's a vulnerability. Do you think the FBI should tell Apple what that vulnerability is? Not, not oh, will they? Should they? Yeah. <laughs> should they? I mean, if there's a vulnerability in, in encryption, and the FBI clearly wants us to be safe because it keeps on sending out uh, it issues uh, warnings, you know, about car makers, and it issues warnings about ransomware. They clearly want us to be safe. Yes. If that's the case, then they should let Apple know uh, where the vulnerability is. But and you can bet Apple wants to know where it is, and they they've been researching, you know, how they did this. Yeah. Um, I saw something today where, you know, an anonymous person said that they they were able to type in more than ten. Um, password tries yeah. and it it, it it didn't you know erase the drive so clearly believe now I've been talking to other people uh, that said that they and this isn't people from Apple this is people in the in the community that know encryption and know uh, the ability to hackers they don't believe that they get in yeah I, I, I believe that they did get in, and I believe that, that Apple is very worried about this, but I don't think for a second the FBI will tell Apple, because Apple because the FBI wants this vulnerability, because they don't want to have to do this dance with Apple Absolutely. every single time they, they pick up a lost iPhone. That being said, Apple, has, I think, has been pretty clear in saying they're going to do everything they possibly can 
to continue to lock down the iPhone with future versions of the OS. Well, and let's be clear, though. Apple is not doing that to spite the government. Yeah. Apple is doing that to protect its customers. And and by saying right now that Apple is going to do everything that it can to, to keep the iPhone locked down, that's no different than what they've been saying uh, or could have said for the past you know, four or five years. Uh, they have continued to lock down the iPhone. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's going to be interesting to see... Sorry, then the other question becomes, <clears throat> the FBI didn't unlock this phone. From all reports, some external company, whether it's the Israelis or somebody else, some other company did this. And as someone pointed out, some, I think it was the Wall Street Journal said, um, should hackers help the FBI? They're not helping the FBI. The FBI is paying them thousands upon thousands of dollars to do this. That being Correct. said... Should Apple then put the word out, hey, we'll pay you to help fix these problems too? Well, I, I don't know that Apple will do anything like that. Now, are you talking that they should go to the government and say you pay us and we'll help you or nope, go nope. to the hackers? The go a Apple can put the word out to the hacking community. We're going to pay whoever did this X numbers of dollars, 100000 yeah. 200000 whatever, double double what the FBI paid you to come in and show us how you did this so we can lock it down. Right. No, I, I would have no issue with that, Not to be honest. honest. Yep. I mean, you know, other companies have bounties on on major bugs and, and vulnerabilities, and and I don't have a problem with bounties. Yep. I really don't. I mean, it's software. There, there's going to be ways to, to break it, and clearly, if you believe what was said in this case, there was a way to break it, and there is somebody out there who is very, very smart that was able to break the encryption on the. Think about that. They were able to break the encryption on the iPhone, and and you know, or at least get it, allow them to get into the to the iPhone. However, they yeah. broke whatever they broke. They were able to break Apple's system. You, you don't think Apple wants to talk to that guy or girl? <coughs> As Brian Moreau says in the RC chat room. That's just not how Apple works. I do not think I've ever heard of them supporting bounties to find holes in their security. And no, they, no. they, they, they don't do that. That's absolutely true. To, Maybe yeah, they to should. My, to my knowledge, they've never supported uh, bounties. No. But, you know, I mean, are we in a situation now that Apple should support bounties? Who knows? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I mean, Apple has a lot of smart people working there, too. So... If, if you build something, they will come and yep. they will break it down. That's exactly. just the way it is. What do you think the chances are that the FBI is flat out lying? That they, in fact, haven't broken this, but as a lot of folks said beforehand, there's probably nothing on this phone of any real value anyway. It was his work phone, not his private phone. He destroyed his private phone. So you got to assume he didn't just destroy his work phone because there wasn't anything on it. So let's go with that assumption. Maybe the FBI didn't break it. What do you think the chances are of that, that they're just looking at the American public and lying their asses off? Well, I think that's very possible. And it's, and sure, I think it's possible because of the perception of the whole thing. I don't think that they wanted to set a precedent in, in um, going to court yeah. and losing that case, which it looked like they were going to do. They were going to lose. So... They had to find a way out. <clears throat> I don't believe that there was anything significant on that phone, or he would have smashed that one too. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not like he he got to the to the center with his guns and thought, "Oh God, I forgot to smash my work phone." <laughs> I knew I was forgetting you know? something. I turned the stove <laughs> you know? off. I locked the doors. Oh shit! Yeah. You know, uh, it's his work phone. He's not going to take a chance knowing that he could be monitored on that phone. I don't think that there was anything there, no. and and you know that's just that's just my opinion. Sure. Um, could the FBI? I mean, they they wouldn't call it lying. They would, you know, it's it's a a, a deception to uh, to keep everybody on their toes. No. The, the the terrorist community, I mean. Um, so you know, are they lying? Is that a good thing? Uh, sure, sure. You know, I mean, why not? 
it's certainly going to be an issue that's going to be ongoing for a while. Like I said, this is not over. There's still the Brooklyn case that has to be decided. And as folks, other folks have pointed out, there's still 70 other, or sorry, 175 other phones out there in various versions of the iOS that various government agencies want Apple to help them fix. So I think this is still going to have to go through either the court system or the Congress. It's not a good sign, though, that we've already seen a few Congress people have stepped up and are trying to introduce bills that would force Apple to do this from a legal standpoint. Do you think this is something that Congress should get involved in, or should they leave it to the courts? Well, I think, I think uh, you know, overall Congress has to get involved in it. You know, um, they're going to get involved. Uh, the government wants them to get involved uh, because they want a law passed that, that just makes this. Uh, it, it, so that it's going to happen, yep. you know. I mean, this is something that that they want to see written down. Yep. You know, it's a law. Here, you here's the phone. You don't have a choice. They they can't afford to go through this every single time they have an iPhone. Uh, they've already lost once yep. in in New York. They don't want to lose again. You know. Uh, so yeah. In what has to be considered to be the, the funniest story in a sad kind of way all week, last week um, the internet turned Tay, Microsoft's millennial AI chatbot, into a racist bigot. Did you see this? <laughs> this had to be the funniest thing in the world, if only because at least a certain percentage of us were going, Microsoft, how did you not see this coming? <laughs> it's the internet. You just gotta laugh. I it's mean, full really. of a holes. How could you just say, "Hey, everybody, teach teach Tay how to speak"? I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Tay. <laughs> I literally saw this story and started laughing out loud because, my, and for a small percentage of that time that I'm laughing at my ass off, I'm thinking, I feel sorry for Microsoft. But then I'm thinking, no. How did you not know this was going to happen, Microsoft? Well, I think everybody else knew. Yes, absolutely. Now, the interesting thing is Microsoft has gone ahead. If you uh, paid attention to their Build conference keynotes uh, today, they're going ahead with this. They think this is the next level of user interface, what they call conversational user interface, chatbot for well, Siri and Cortana and Google and those kinds of things, they seem to think that this is the way at least a certain percentage of us will interact with our computers going forward. So maybe Microsoft's heart was in the right place and wanting to test this out. But they've got to understand and know ahead of time that when you open things up on the Internet, the Internet, because it's full of 12-year-old boys, will turn that thing into the worst possible version of itself. Yeah. You can't get away from it. Unless you code against it, you right. can't get away with this. What do you, I agree. What do you think of the idea of this user interface, this conversational user interface idea? Uh, I kind of like it, you know. and I mean, you know, I'm looking at, at voice and things like that from from a very limited high view yeah. of Siri, you yeah. know, I mean, that, that's kind of how I am. I'm looking at this and, and I like it, but you know, is it something that, I don't know. Is it something that will, um, will catch on and be the future? I think if you look far enough, um, into the future, yes. You know, look at look at Amazon's little doohickey thing. You know, it's it's kind of conversational. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, I I think if you look far enough into the future and you're walking around your house and your house is all wired up and you talk and you know it answers and and it's listening and it can do things for you and I I think that's the ultimate thing. It's not just the conversation. It's the fact that it can do things for you, yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, beyond, Hey, turn the lights on. Yeah. It's, it, it's more, 
oh, I need to preheat the oven. Can you turn that on? And, you know, can you do this? So it has control of, of areas of your house that, you know, previously you had to control. Yeah. So well, when I think conversation, I don't, I don't want to talk to a robot, <clears throat> but I don't mind having some form of artificial intelligence helping me out. How often do you use Siri now on a daily basis? Oh, I, I use it. I would, yeah, I use it daily. Really? I, yes. but, but sometimes it's, it's very inane things like, you know, set a timer yep. or, you know, different things. But yeah, I don't do things like that anymore. I, I, I always use Siri for stuff like that, which, you know, as I say that, I'm thinking, wow, I never thought I'd say that, but it's true. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily, uh, I don't use Siri for adding calendar events, for example, no. because I don't know. Well, actually, I don't know why, because Siri's really good, but <laughs> I, I don't know why I don't, uh, use that. I should, I'm going to try that because I added a calendar event today yeah. and, uh, and I went in and, and, you know, typed it out. It wasn't a big calendar event, you yep. know, but still, I, I typed it out instead of asking Siri. To, I'm going to ask Siri to do that. I, I use Siri for exactly three kinds of things. I Every morning, I use it as a timer for my coffee, and now that I've got it plugged in, I do the Hey Siri thing, which is you know kind of cool from across the room. Hey Siri, yep. set, a, set a, a four-minute timer. I use it when I go park it when when I go ride the motorcycle and I uh, park at a parking meter. I will tell Siri, "Hey Siri, remind me that I have to repark in an hour, or two hours, whatever it might be." Hey, can you tell Siri to remember your location? I don't know. That's a good question. I, I I've never tried that because I, I it's my motorcycle. I'm hold, never going to forget where my motorcycle is. Hold on, hold on. Okay. Oh. Hmm. Siri won't come on because I'm on the phone with you. Yeah. Okay. That makes that kind of makes sense. Nah. I'm wondering, you know, for parking. Yeah. If, yeah. if you're out, can you say, "Hey Siri, remember where I parked" yeah. or something like that? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe some of the people listening would know that. Yeah. It's, I don't it's, know. Or it's, it's never an issue for me because it's it's my motorcycle. I'm never gonna gonna forget where I put my motorcycle. You know. <laughs> well. Yeah, but. But you your, know. yeah, your rental car at the airport. I've lost rental cars I, at airports. I, I have a shopping cart, so yeah. you know I mean I I I don't want to park my shopping cart and forget where I left it because yeah. it has all my all my items. In, yeah. you know? And the other thing I use Siri for is to add items to my any list uh, um, uh, shopping list. That's it. I don't use it for, mm -hmm. any, for anything else. So I don't see how these bots, conversational bots, are going to be of use to a lot of people. But other folks, please let us know. I'm not like I oh. said, and Jim and I aren't heavy Siri users. So if hold on, yep, I'm gonna try the, I'm gonna try the iPhone SE and see. Okay. Oh, damn. Hold on. Hey Siri, remember my location? Okay, I'll remind you. No, no, yeah. don't remind me of yeah. my location. See, and there's the no. problem I have with Siri. Are you sure you want to delete this reminder? Yes, delete it, I Siri. It. Uh, Siri, uh. Oh, never Siri mind. Here. How may I help you? <laughs> Siri, Siri, stop it. I can't stop thinking about tomorrow. <laughs> Siri, you're driving me crazy. That doesn't sound good. See, and this is the only thing I've used Siri for is to say dumb things to it. <laughs> you know, just, just stupid stuff. People say, hey, say I this. love you, Siri. Yeah, here we go. You hardly know me. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Mm, it doesn't matter at all. Exactly. It doesn't make a difference at all. But yeah, I, I, I don't use Siri for anything serious. I don't use it to look things up on the internet or for that kind of stuff. Oh. I'll, 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 I'll type it out on, on, on Google or on Wikipedia. No. Or like See, I use Siri for that kind of stuff. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'll use Siri for, you know, what's the, uh, the NHL schedule tonight. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it just on my watch a lot, I use it. Uh, for for that kind of stuff, just you know, I'll say uh, you know the hey word, and then I'll say Siri, and uh, what's the NHL schedule tonight? And 
she pops it up and shows me, and great. Good to go. I hate to bring this up, but is Boston in the playoffs? Listen, just shut up. <laughs> Wait, it makes you feel better, not the Canadians, man. No well, Canadian you know, team is making the playoffs. Boston is actually in the playoffs right okay. now, but don't jinx me. I'm sorry. Well, no, I have to jinx you. My Canadians aren't in. The Canucks aren't in, so I gotta, I gotta cheer against somebody. Well, then you should hope that the Bruins are in, so you can cheer against them in the playoffs. And you know what? I, I, I only ever cheer against Marshawn anyway. I freaking hate that guy. He's a great guy. He's not great. He's not great by any, any shape of the foot, shape of the imagination. <laughs> Let's talk about your two reviews, folks. Uh, Jim, because this could get ugly if we keep going. Um, uh, Jim has got two reviews up on the LoopInsight.com. One review the. 9.7-inch iPad Pro, the other the iPhone SE. Here's a question for you, Jim. Which one of these two devices will be more important to Apple over the next two years? God damn. I tried to think of all the questions you'd ask me. I never <laughs> thought of that one. Um, I'm good, damn it. I've been doing this a while now. Come on. That's that's tough to say because I think they're they're both important in in different ways. Yeah. Um, you know the the iPad the iPad really introduced an incredible technology with True Tone. True. Yep. Yeah. You know I people look at the iPad and say oh they just you know shrunk the big one down and made it more powerful. Yeah. 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 yeah but they put in <laughs> True Tone. Explain to the audience what what True Tone is. So True Tone adjusts the the screen based on the ambient light wherever you are. Yep. So I went out and you know I I trust Apple I do but when they were talking about True Tone I was thinking come on no it doesn't so I set up the iPad I went outside. And like a complete dick, I set it up in, in direct sunlight, like the sun <laughs> shining right on it. And I sat down, and I could see the screen perfectly. It was amazing. Yeah. And it was partly because of the anti-reflective display that they're now using, and partly because of True Tone. And True Tone has four sensors. It measures the amount of light around you. Yeah and the type of light around you, and adjust the screen color, not just brightness. It doesn't go bright and dim. It adjusts the color and the brightness of the display so that you can see the screen. Yep. And I could see the screen. I sat outside for an hour until I almost cooked. And that's and then you know you go inside and it measures the 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 color and and brightness of the uh, the ambient light around you there and adjusts the screen so that it's good for for when you're inside. It's amazing. It really is. Now, as a test, I held my iPhone uh, 6s Plus up next to the iPhone and I had difficulty reading the the iPhone. Yeah, but I could see the iPad perfectly. See, I think the iPad Pro is going to be more important over the next two years than the iPhone SE. If only because Apple is going to sell millions upon millions upon millions of whatever iPhone they put out there. That's just a gimme. I think this might be the last gasp of the iPad. I think that no. if, yeah, I think if Apple doesn't, over the next two years, sell significant numbers of the iPad, because sales have decreased every year for the last five years, it's pot it's potentially possible. Potentially possible. It's possible that Apple may discontinue the iPad line entirely. In no, years. don't be silly. Now you're just talking crazy. <laughs> Holy God! I mean, you know, I'm wondering what kind of drugs you're <laughs> on over there. I said possible, not likely. I said possible. Well, you, it, talking like that, you should join the rumor site. <laughs> well, if that's all the rumors I've seen on Loop in Sight the last six months, I'm on a rumor site. Wow. Wow. Don't get me started, pal. Okay, well, th this conversation's going down real <laughs> quick, isn't it? Now, see, uh, it, it's interesting what you say about True Tone, because as a photographer, that's the last thing in the world I would want. 
I don't want, and thank goodness I found out True Tone, you can turn it off. But as a photographer, if I'm editing photos, I don't want no, no, the no, color display change based on the light around me. Right. I understand that. And you can you can turn it off. It's a it's a setting with just a little button. Yeah. But um, uh, we're we're not talking about uh, you know editing photos and and you know all the high flute and stuff that you do. We're just talking about normal people trying to read their iPads outside. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's and and it should be noted that the the new iPad also has the P3 color gamut. Which is a, a wide range uh, uh, color gamut that was introduced in the iMac 5K. Yep. Imagine that the same color gamut is in the iMac 5K. Do you even it's know what color the... gamut is, Jim? I do. <laughs> who told I you? Do. Who told? Who explained it to you? Wikipedia. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, I it is, it is absolutely amazing to think that the iPad can display the same color gamut that that the uh, iMac 5K can. Yeah, yeah. And um, when when I went for a briefing on the the new iMacs, I was I was amazed with the colors because uh, you know it was like pictures of um, of green, you know, and and there were actual shading that uh, from an um, uh, from the old color gamut, you couldn't see, but on P3, you could. And now the iPad has that. I mean, come on. Really? Yeah. People are complaining that, you know, all they did was shrink it down. Come on! <laughs> By the way, our, our good friend uh, DJ McIntosh has written an app called Bro, Where's My Car? An easy, lightweight way, lightweight way to quickly mark your parking space. Okay, I'm going to download that. It's a 99 cent app called "Bro, Where's My Car," offered by our good friend DJ McIntosh. So check that out. See, you get a chance. Now, can I track my shopping cart because it has my sleeping bag in it, and everything <laughs> from under the bridge? Well, yeah, in theory, because it's 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 marking a space. It's not actually physically marking your car. So if your car moves, I'm, it's not going to be able to tell you that. Well, nobody better take my shopping cart. Well, you you, you got watch um, out for that kind of stuff. Um, I need a new one. Bro, where's my shopping cart? That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so the color gamut is good on the, the new iPad. It's not just another, it's not just a, a scaled down version of the 10-inch, no, sorry, not. of the 13-inch iPad Pro. Did you use the pencil with it? I know you're not an artiste. But did you try using the pencil? Well, there shouldn't be any difference. I, 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 the, no, there's no difference. No, there's so. no difference at all. I, I mean, uh, you know, I can see, and I, I said in the review, that, um, uh, for me, to use the larger iPad was an actual decision. I had to decide, okay, where am I going to use this? I'm going to put it on a tabletop or I'm going to put it somewhere. It's not something you just grab and start using yeah. because it's big. You know, but with the the nine point seven, I just grab it and start using. It. Yeah. I can use that in portrait and type. I can use it in landscape. I can set it on a table. I can put it on my lap. I can do anything. You know, and the only complaint that I had was the keys on the on the smart cover. Yeah, I wish those it's a, were it's a lot smaller, isn't it? it? It's it's significantly smaller. I wish the keys were bigger. Yeah. I'm used to the keys on the the twelve inch MacBook. Yeah. I love the keys on the twelve inch MacBook. They're big and and they're they have that new but butterfly mechanism yeah. and you know they're just wonderful. I love them. I love typing on that thing, and you know the keys on on the smart cover are kind of small and there is space to make them bigger. So make them bigger. But doesn't it Why have do to you be need the exact to make them smaller? Doesn't it have to be the exact same size as the iPad Pro. If they made the keys bigger, wouldn't it make the keyboard bigger? Are you saying remove some no, other keys? No, there there's already space in there to make the keys bigger. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. Right? I mean, if you look at the keys, there's spacing in between the keys. Okay. Why? Why yeah. is there so much spacing in between? Just I'm gonna I'm gonna pull Walt Mossberg and just say do it because I want it done. <laughs> 
Apparently, Walt got kind of testy last week with all of us criticizing him over his over his piece where he uh, um, said that the next iPhone must be remarkable. And Walt sent out emails to at least three people I know who would criticize him, and they came back to me and said, "Oh, Walt, Walt's getting a little a, a little feisty in his old age." Like, yeah, well, yeah, you know, he's he's got to accept the fact that he says something stupid. We're going to critique him, okay? Well. And 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 rightfully so. Exactly, exactly. Suck it up, Walt. You you know how this works. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you said about in the uh, iPhone SE review that I thought was really interesting, you thought there'd be not significant numbers, but a certain percentage of people who would go back from the iPhone 6, the 6S, the 6 Plus, whatever it might be, to an iPhone SE. Do you really think that? Do you think people would, would give up the screen size and go back to a smaller device? I I. I really do. Really? I really do it. And that came that came after using it and yep. came from talking to a lot of people. Uh, when I, I posted a pic, I don't know, maybe yesterday or the day before and said, you know, rocking an iPhone SE. And I heard from a lot of people that had, uh, you know, some, some very interesting questions about usability. Yep. And, and I said, did you have an iPhone 5S? Yes. It's exactly the same, yeah. but more powerful. That's right. You know, it's more powerful. You you can and, and they said, I, I'm really thinking about going back yeah. because I love that form factor so much. Now, think about uh, us as a group, your listeners, uh, you and I. We will upgrade to get the latest and greatest yes. thing. Yes, we we may not like everything about why we upgrade. One of the things that a lot of people didn't like was the actual size. I mean, all we heard about when Apple was on the iPhone S, uh, 5S is, oh, they need a bigger phone. They need a bigger phone. Everybody wants a bigger phone. Well, now everybody wants small, you know. <laughs> and so uh, Apple put out a smaller phone for them, and it's the 4-inch, and I think it's a great idea for them. But I think a lot of people will go back. And, you know, the question I ask, does it matter? No. It doesn't matter. Apple's still selling iPhones. Yep. You know, so... I thought it was hilarious. The, uh, the 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 numbnuts at Wired magazine posted a story that said, "You'll use the iPhone SE differently, really, differently than we use the three don't. or the four or the five. It's the same phone." I don't use it different. How do they use it differently? I have no idea. They're just stupid. You're not going to use crap. it differently. It's just going to be more powerful. Now. The other thing is, that, and one of the things I thought you're just be, you're just making that shit. I, I swear to God, I'm not. Is they said they literally wrote something that stupid. Yeah. The only issue that I thought some people might have with the iPhone SE was the lack of 3D touch. But I don't think that's an issue if you've never used 3D touch. I've never used it, so I don't care whether it's on my phone. Maybe if you've used it on the newest versions, you wouldn't want to go back to not using it. You've used the newest versions. You've used 3D touch. You think people would miss out on not having it on the iPhone SE? Well, see, there, there's the funny thing. Uh, people, people, when I posted that I was using the the, uh, the SE, uh, people asked me, "Oh, do you miss 3D touch?" Yeah. And I immediately responded, "No." And then I realized, "Holy shit, I don't use it that much." <laughs> exactly. <you know? laughs> and I and I said in the review, having said that. I think I should start trying to use it more on my <laughs> on my 6s plus, yeah. but I really don't use it a whole lot. So uh, that's I don't know if that's a problem. I, I don't think it's a problem. But I, I after I I wrote today, I went back to my iPhone 6s uh, plus and and started tapping on icons and yeah. holding, you know, yeah. to, to see what 3D touch stuff came up. I, I don't know. I mean. I don't think that the things that are missing are deal breakers for people that want that size. Yeah. I think the overall technology and power would be deal breakers. If Apple came out and said, oh, yes, it's got an A7 chip and it's got graphics performance equal to that of the 5S and it's got, you know, whatever. Well, um, no, no, I don't think so. Yeah. But, you know, they basically took a, a 6S and put it in a 5S body. Now, it's missing... 3D Touch, and it's got first-generation Touch ID, which I could care less about because Touch ID still works. Uh, the FaceTime camera is 1.2 megapixels. I, it's a selfie camera. Get over yourself. Yeah, really. You know, um, and, you know, Wi-Fi and LTE are, are the, the last-generation stuff. 
well, you know, whatever. I, I don't, I don't care about that either. I mean, it's still fast. It's yep. still getting it's on the internet and you can still do everything you need to do. So um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's a good, I think like we talked about on last week's show that the Apple is going to sell millions upon millions, tens of millions of these things. And they sold 30 or 40 million uh, of the iPhone, the smaller iPhones in 2015. They're going to sell at least that many iPhone SEs and probably more. Um, it will cannibalize the iPhone 6s, but Apple doesn't care about cannibalizing as long as you're buying their products. They right. would care if you were switching to a Samsung or switching to another device, but as long right. as you're buying Apple's devices, they're pretty much okay with it because they're still getting your money. Yeah, do it. That's what do whatever want. you need to do. I had a choice to, uh, uh, as we wrap up here, a choice of one or two stories. Apple's 40th anniversary is this Friday. Congratulations to Apple. Really interesting story I posted up on loopinsight.com today. Um, Horace Didu, I think I'm saying his name right, from Asimco, he pointed out that Apple at the age of 40 has sold 1.4 billion computing devices in the last 40 years. More than any other company combined, because there are no other companies that have lasted this long. There are no other computer manufacturers <laughs> that have lasted as long as Apple. Isn't that fascinating? It's pretty crazy. When isn't we it? consider how bad off Apple was in the mid 90s, for them to have made it another 20 years and become the largest single manufacturer of computers in the history of mankind. Is pretty yep. damn cool. So congratulations to yep. everybody at Apple, past and, and, and present, for m making it through all of this, and, and, and hopefully we're all along for the ride for the next 40 years. So And, yep. and also, uh, Mac OS X is 15 years old. I'm going to push those to, to, to next week's show, because I wanted to get Jim's opinion about the most remarkable story I read today. This is from The Independent in the, in the United Kingdom the lovely land of Britain. They did a, a survey, and they wanted to find out what was voted the best British song of all time. Jim being a musician, Jim being a big music guy. Ow, are you throwing empties around now? No, man, they just, they fall out of my hands. This band happened to occupy the first, second, third, and fourth positions on the inaugural poll of the best British songs <clears throat> of all time. So it's pretty obvious who this is going to be, right? It's going to be the Beatles. You'd be wrong. Oh, okay. The Rolling Stones. You'd be wrong. Led Zeppelin. You'd be wrong. The top four songs of all time is voted by 50,000 people in Britain is Wonderwall by Oasis. Are, yeah. you, are you kidding me? Yeah. That wouldn't make the top ten songs I've heard in the last week. I, I think Oasis, or, or I think uh, uh, Britain is fucking with us. That's, <laughs> that's just trolling us now. That's, yeah. just, that's just ridiculous. There is no way I can believe that Britain's actually believe. Now, maybe, you're, maybe they're, the interview or the survey was only of 12-year-old Britons, but if it's of actual real live Britons, the fact that they could vote Oasis even in the top 20. The yeah. first Beatles song hit number 19. It makes me sad. It really does. It makes me sad. Wonder Wall number one, Don't Look Back in Anger, Champagne Supernova, Are You Kidding Me? And yeah. Live Forever. Forget about Sgt. Pepper or, uh, you know, Paint It Black or David Story Bowie to Heaven. David Bowie Heroes was on, only came in at number seven. Yeah, see. Give Me Shelter, The Stones, was the first Stone song in the top ten. That was tenth. The Beatles yeah. don't show up until number 13 with Hey Jude. <laughs> number 13. That's just insane. <laughs> I'm so upset about this. You, you have no idea how pissed off I am about this because we See, always thought the, that Brits had good taste in music. This is nuts. The, the, the Brits are over there laughing their ass off. I freaking hope so, man, because there's, that's the only excuse for, for this, because this is obscene otherwise. Folks, we're talking to Jim yeah. Downpour of The Loop at loopinsight.com. He has his own two podcasts up on the Apple Store. Go search for Jim Downpour. You'll find him. Jim, thanks very much for joining me, buddy. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Sean. Have a good night. See you. Bye. Yeah, I, I, I saw that story and just like literally shook my head, 
look for the April Fool's joke of it, because it's got to be an April Fool's joke. It's got to be. There's, there's no other possible explanation for anything by Oasis being in the top ten. Ahead of the Stones, Led Zeppelin, the Beatles. Are you kidding me? Brian Monroe says, the Brits are trolling you, Sean. I know. they got to be. they got to be trolling us. Just just made me so angry. <laughs> Have you guys used... Hang on. Uh, let me do the... Um, I'm pushing the button here first. This is the Starting Point Photography segment brought to you by, well, me. Startingpointphotography.com. Check it out. Startingpointphotography.com. Um, I'm going this uh, this weekend. I'm going to a place um, two hours west of me. For you folks who are familiar with Vancouver, it's on the other side of Vancouver, up near a town called Whistler. Whistler is very famous for it was a site of the part of the site of the 2010 Winter Olympics. Um, if you're a skier, you know Whistler has been voted the number one ski resort in North America like 10 years in a row. I don't ski there because it's too expensive. I, I can't afford it. But just south of Whistler is a place called Brandywine Falls in, I think, the Brandywine Falls National or Provincial Park. And it's it's a fall. It's a waterfall. And I want to go there this weekend. I saw this picture. And I want to go there this weekend to re basically recreate this image. Um, this is Brandywine Falls by Jamie Out on Instagram. Check this out. This is just a beautiful Image. Let me see if I can't pull this up. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba. Open an image in a new tab, and then show the image there. And for the most part, you guys can can see this image. I'm really, really wanting to, for the most part, recreate this image. Now, this is, in general, it could be described as a technical image. This is not a point and shoot image. This is not an image that you can capture easily with your iPhone, with your point and shoot, with your DSLR. This is an image that requires technical knowledge. And one of the things I love, love about photography is the fact that it fulfills, as I said earlier, the creative side of me, but also the technical side of me, the problem-solving side of me. <clears throat> when conditions aren't absolutely perfect, you've got to know enough about your camera in general. Sorry, you have to know enough about photography in general, and your camera specifically, to be able to manipulate light and or your camera to capture those less than perfect moments, those less than perfect conditions, whether that be not enough light, whether that be uh, uh, weather conditions, whether that be where you're standing, whether that might be a whole bunch of different things. What you want to do is be able to see the image in your mind's eye what you're trying to accomplish, and then learn how to manipulate the scene, including your camera, to recreate what's in your mind's eye. So in this case, if you just walked up to Brandywine Falls, if you stood where that person in the picture was standing, the, 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 the photographer in this case, and took this picture, you would not get this picture on the automatic settings of your iPhone, of your point-and-shoot, of your DSLR. Not possible. What you need to do is to know how to change your camera settings in order to capture this. Now, what this is, is because I can see this, this is a long exposure shot. You notice the, the, the waterfall looks like a curtain. It doesn't look like it's water at all, does it? It looks like it's literally ribbons. And what that is, is rather than taking a snapshot of time with your camera, you're taking not a video, but a picture over time. One image extended through time. Whereas video is a bunch of images taken over time. This is a single image taken over time. Now it's kind of hard to conceptualize. But if you think about <clears throat> one drop of light, sorry, one drop of water coming off of this waterfall, it's reflecting light into your camera. With a very, very high shutter speed, you're capturing that light in that one one thousandth of a second. So it shows up as a dot of light, a dot of an image on your camera, on your camera sensor. 
In this case, the photographer is holding his shutter open for a longer period of time. So rather than that one drop of water reflecting light in that one moment, that drop of water, because the shutter stays open for two, three, four, five seconds, as the drop of water goes down the waterfall, it continues to reflect light into the open shutter, and that stream or that string or that length of light, however you want to think about it, gets captured on your camera sensor. That's why you, you don't see in this picture drops of light. Let's see if I can't zoom into the picture to show you more of it. You'll see that this is not individual droplets of light. This is a stream of light, a stream of water. <clears throat> So what you need to do is go to this location or go to any location. It, it, this is really fun to do with flowing water. It's really easy to do with flowing water, too. What you do is you go to any kind of <clears throat> waterfall. It can be a big waterfall, I guess. It can be a small waterfall. It doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. You just want flowing water. And you need to use a tripod. You cannot capture this kind of image holding the camera in your hands. You cannot hold your camera still for more than about one one hundredth of a second. Like I said, this is probably a two to five second exposure. There is no way you could hold your camera steady enough for that period of time and not get blur of the rocks and of the person standing there. So, you find your spot, you set your tripod up, you... Here's the technical side of things that I find interesting. You set your camera's aperture, because this is a landscape shot. Remember what we talked before about, uh, about aperture? The smaller aperture number, the fewer things are in focus. The bigger aperture number, the more things that are in focus. So in this case, the photographer would have shot, say, at f11. So a mid-range aperture number. <clears throat> Put the camera in the tripod, set your aperture to f11, and then this is where the experimentation comes from. His first shot, I can almost I can almost guarantee you this is not just one picture and he walked away. He probably set the first shot up. He told his model to go stand over there and don't move. He would have yelled, all right, get ready to shoot, don't move. And he would have taken a, a shot for one second. So the shutter would have opened up and then closed. And he would looked at the back of the camera and gone, eh, it's not what I wanted. So now he's going to set it for two seconds. Okay, getting ready to shoot, don't move. Open it up, 1,001, 1,002, and it would have closed. And we looked at it again. And he would have kept taking more and more shots until he got the image he was looking for, until he got it exactly the way he wanted it. Now, one of the problems, maybe he might have seen that he got the right stream or <clears throat> field of the water, but because the shutter stayed open for so long, it was too bright otherwise. So how do you manipulate your camera to lessen the brightness? Well, you can use neutral density filters. You can uh, lessen your exposure compensation. You can use a higher, or sorry, a lower ISO. There's a bunch of different things you can do to manipulate the camera. And this is, again, the technical aspect of it. The creative aspect of it is finding that spot, understanding what kind of shot you want to take, mentally visualizing that shot, seeing that, Waterfall and going, oh, yeah, I can just see how I want this. And then manipulating the camera's controls in order to capture what you see in, in your mind's eye. It's a key to becoming a better photographer is not, having, not only having a good eye, which you have to have, but also a sense of experimentation and a desire to learn some of the technical aspects of your camera and how it's, used, how it's used. You don't have to know exactly what ISO does. Sorry, what ISO is. You have to know what it does, how it affects your shots. You don't have to know the mathematical formula for how to figure out f-stop, but you do need to know how changing the f-stop affects your photography. Same with shutter speed. You don't have to know the technical aspects in depth of those things, but you have to know how those things affect your photography. <clears throat> and one of the ways you do that is by learning and practicing. Two things I'm constantly beating on the students about. Learn, either through YouTube, through books, 
through taking classes with people like me, through um, whatever it might be. But then you got to go practice this stuff. That's what I want to do. That's what I'm going to do this weekend. This weekend, I'm going to get up bright and early. I'm going to go to Brandywine Falls. It's going to be a two-hour motorcycle ride. I'm going to be happier than a pig and poop riding out there. And I'm going to spend all day in this area trying to capture these sorts of images. And I'm going to take both my iPhone and my DSLR and my tripod and see if I can't capture those sorts of things on both devices. And we'll probably talk about it a little later on in the week, next week, on uh, Your Mac Life. Then. Don't forget, I'm also looking for, I've already got a, a, a few, photo critiques. I love doing the photo critiques with my meetup group. We did, a, we did another group here this past weekend on Saturday. I've had uh, 15 people show up out of 40. Um, so if you want a, a gentle, friendly, loving critique of your photos, please send it in to me, sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. Just send, send me the photo at the highest resolution you can. And once a month, I'll pick a photo out of the, out of the, the, the batch, and we'll, we'll do a critique of it. We'll talk about what's good, what's bad, how to do things differently, what you might have done. Give me a little story of the photo, and give me some details of the photo, what you might know about it, whether it was shot, uh, what kind of camera was shot on, if you remember the lenses and the settings, those kinds of details. Send those off to me at Sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. And by the way, if anyone's in town and wants to go to Brandywine Falls with me, let me know. I'll be happy to go out there with you. You don't have to ride a motorcycle either. You can be, you can be in a car. I'm good with that. <clears throat> Somebody pointed out to me that they didn't realize that Apple had changed the... Um, oh, sorry. Hang on. ArcSign says, Sean, what would happen if you set your iPhone to HDR and locked focus and exposure to a darker area of the waterfall scene? It's a good question. We're going to assume it's on a, a tripod. If you've locked the focus and exposure on a dark area. I don't I, I wonder if the HDR would would compensate. HDR high dynamic range. Um, it's on your iPhone. I tell everyone to turn it on. What happens with the iPhone is is it takes a picture that exposes for the bright, for the mid, and for the dark, and then combines them all together. So I think if you did and I'll I'll, I'll give this a try, Arcsign, to to see if it does what I think it's gonna do. If you tell your iPhone that this is the dark area, sorry, if this is the, 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 the focus area, I think it might see that as the mid-range and then go wrong on the upper and lower. I don't know. I'll, I'll try and, 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 and see. Um, someone was mentioning uh, they didn't realize that iCloud had changed their storage plans <clears throat> in the last uh, year. Not year, September, September 15th. Do you know now? You, you, you know you get five gigs of storage for the iCl for iCloud, but do you know that Apple has lowered the? Do you remember the Apple has lowered the price? Uh, 99 cents for 50 gigabytes a month for iCloud storage. That's pretty cheap. I don't need or want 200 gigabytes that they're charging three bucks for. I don't need a terabyte because I'm using Flickr for a terabyte of data for free. But 99 cents for 50 gigabytes, that's pretty good. I think it's a pretty good deal. I, I'm, I, I, I've taken advantage of that, and I, I'm using that yeah, iCloud 99 cents, 50 gigabytes, 99 cents a month. I use that now. And I back up a lot of photos to iCloud because I like having multiple backups. Uh, Brian Minosa, some, some of my clients need the 200 gigabytes. Yeah, if you need it, get it. But for me, 50 gigabytes is pretty doggone good. I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew. But they, and if, if you have friends that need backup storage, this might be an option for them. Let's see what else I got going on here. I, I know I mentioned it while while Jim was on, but and we'll talk about, we'll talk about it more um, next week. Uh, Mac OS 10 has turned 15 years old. How many of us are old enough to remember that first public beta of Mac OS, the new Mac OS 10? I remember thinking how cool it was. And then in research for this, I went back and looked online at examples of Mac OS 10. Holy crap, it's butt ugly. 
It's, it's awful. That Aqua interface is is retina destroying. <laughs> Kids, if you don't know what we're talking about, do a Google search for Mac OS X public beta uh, images. They're horrendous. It's terrible. Uh, yeah, Sherry, man, that Aqua pinstripes. Yeah, that was just just oh jeez, it was horrible. Um, but we'll talk about that uh, more on next week's show with Jim. But congratulations, Apple. 15 years for this OS. This is the OS that I think saved Apple. I don't know that if Apple hadn't done this, they would have survived to this point. I think the combination of buying Next and turning it into OS X and the original Bondi Blue iMac saved Apple, along with, obviously, Steve Jobs. I think this is the three points of the triangle that without one of those, it wouldn't have happened the way it did. So, uh, Brian Monroe says, you wanted to see Butt Ugly, Sean? Have a look at Next Step. That was ugly. Oh, yeah, because remember, Next Step is the, 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 is the, the father of OS X. So if OS X was ugly, then, yeah, Next Step was going to be just, just as ugly. Um, as always, uh, love getting emails from you guys. Send me emails to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com or to sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. Get an email from uh, Scott Thrift in Sydney, Australia. Hey, Sean, I've noticed all the hair pulling and hysteria over OS 9.3, causing people to find themselves locked out of older devices, primarily those without Touch ID. Seriously, he says? I mean, who doesn't keep track of the Apple ID they logged into set up with a phone? I'm not sure if it's just the Australian rollout of iOS updates or the way I'm set up, but I always get asked for my Apple ID password after updating. I also get asked for it when I download from the Apple Store after restarting my iOS device. If someone doesn't know the password for the associated Apple ID, I'd be asking where they got the device from in the first place. It would be more than possible that the device was stolen or definitely from a gray source. If you sell a device to a pawnbroker, etc., here it must be erased and set back to basic factory settings. That's true, but there's a lot of people who are just forgetful. I know Kim had an awful time remembering her Apple ID password. I was constantly having to rem remind her what her Apple ID password was. And unfortunately, she used her same password for everything. And she still couldn't remember it. So I'll cut some folks some slack. But I, yeah, I, I, I agree that you've got to remember your Apple ID. You've got to remember it. He says, as a side note, I heard you talking about Buckley's cough syrup in the last show. We used to be able to get it in Australia, but it was banned back in the 90s due, the, due to the outrageous amount of pseudoephedrine it contained. I didn't know that Buckley's had pseudoephedrine in it. <laughs> Maybe that's why people like it so much. I know I, I, I certainly hate it. Absolutely. Oh, God, it's just awful. Arxine points out uh, Apple ID can be set differently for App Store and iCloud. That's true, but just because it's set differently doesn't mean you can't remember the passwords. Uh, he says, your device can work for years without an updated iCloud ID, and you wouldn't know it. Sean, is it just me, or is the iPad Pro 9.7 too small to get any actual work done? Yeah, dude, it's just you. Uh, define actual work. Are you trying to hammer nails with it? Then yeah, it's too small. Is actual work <clears throat> reading emails? Yeah, then no, it's not too small. That's the problem with folks who need to pigeonhole these devices into certain categories. This is for work. This is for play. This, this is what work is, and that device doesn't do it, so therefore it's not good for work. Well, it might not be good work for work for you. Maybe you're an architect and need to use AutoCAD. Well, then, yeah, the iPad Pro isn't good for you for work. But trying to generalize it and say that, oh, it's too small to get work done for anybody is simplistic and, quite frankly, idiotic. We see this all the time, especially with the nerdarotis. Because it's not good for them, it shouldn't be good for anybody. Because I don't understand it, then it's not good for anybody. Because I feel this way about it, Everyone should feel this way about it. It's not the way it works. Decide what works for you. 
And don't extrapolate what works for you to everybody. So, for example, is the iPad 9.7 inch too small to get work done? No. I get work done on it all the time. I've edited articles sitting in the Starbucks. I've edited and posted photos, posted to Flickr. I've read Twitter and responded to emails. That's all for me work. So no, it's not too small for me. I'm not saying it's not too small for you, but don't make the assumption that because it doesn't work for you, it won't work for everybody. Because the problem is what happens is <clears throat> the, this nerd class gets asked by the non-nerd class, oh, is the, is the iPad Pro too small for me? And the nerd says, well, it is for me, so yes, it will be for you. And so that person doesn't buy an iPad Pro. Maybe that's the perfect device for them. But because you can't open your mind to other possibilities, you can't empathize with what other people, how other people use their devices, you cut them off from that. Mark Science says, the full-size iPad Pro is too big to get actual work done. The iPad is too big to use as a camera. iPhone 6 Plus is too big to go in my pocket. The iPhone SE is too small to find my purse. Greg in the uh, Telegram room says, hmm, I have 47 engineers, lawyers, and accountants who use the iPads for presentations exclusively, so I call bullshit. Exactly. Again, it might not work for you, but don't make the fatal assumption that that means it won't work for anybody else. Jackie says, last summer I gave my older MacBook Pro to my husband. Now, when he attaches his iPhone to the computer and iTunes automatically boots, both his phone and and mine show up and begin to back up. I'd like to find out if it's an easy fix to delete my phone from his iTunes. A quick check on Safari, probably because I'm in a rush right now, confused me. Could you explain in clear language I've come to expect just how to do that? Um, the the one of the things that happened, Jackie, was when you I'd be willing to bet when you gave your old MacBook Pro to your husband, you didn't reinstall the software. You didn't wipe the drive and start afresh. You might have just handed it to him. So what happens is iTunes still remembers your iPhone. So he plugs his iPhone in, and it says, oh, look, I now see two iPhones. I've been told to back up Jackie's iPhone. Here's this new iPhone. I'll back this one up too. So what you need to do is either you or your husband, open iTunes, uh, let me do. I'll do it right right now because eh, I've got to remember the, the procedure for you. You want to open up iTunes, and the first thing you want to do is when when your iPhone shows up in the upper left of iTunes, you click on your iPhone and you tell your iPhone. Hang on. You tell your iPhone to, under options, where it says automatically sync when this iPhone is connected, uncheck that. And sync with this iPhone over Wi-Fi, uncheck that. And that should solve the problem. The other thing you want to do, too, is go into your iTunes preferences and then in devices and delete all the old backups of your phone off of his MacBook Pro. And that should solve the problem. <clears throat> yeah, ArcSign says, I think the iPhone is Wi-Fi sync turned on. Turn it off. Exactly. That, that's what's happening. Is when iTunes pops up, it sees your husband's phone plugged in, but it also looks around for all the other devices that it might need to back up. iPhones and iPads and, and iPods, whatever it might be. It sees yours and it goes, oh, there's Jackie's phone. I've been told in the past to back up Jackie's phone, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to back up Jackie's phone. So it's only doing what you told it to do, but didn't tell it not to do. No big deal. One of the reasons why a lot of folks um, do, um, Brian, Monroe, uh, Brian Monroe says, she needs to set up a new local user on that Mac. Uh, you don't have to do it that way. If this is your only problem, Jackie, don't worry about it. This will solve the problem. You don't have to set up a, a, a brand new user. Depends on how, how It sounds like if your husband's accepting old MacBook Pros, 
he's probably not a heavy user of the machine anyway. He's probably doing it just for um, uh, email and web browsing. So if it's nothing, if this is the only problem that you guys are having with it, I don't know if I'd bother with with the whole backup and new can pave and new user account and all that kind of stuff. If he is having issues, it's real simple to go in system preferences and create a new user and then log in as that new user and it'll be like it's a brand new machine. And there won't be anything there. So if 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 that's an issue, you could always always do it that way and see if that solves any of the problems. Uh, ArcSign says, Sean, repeat it. Repeat Wi-Fi sync. Clearly, it was mushy and quick. You want to make sure that in your iTunes options, you turn off Wi-Fi sync. That's what's happening. It's syncing up via Wi-Fi. Thanks, ArcSign. <clears throat> Folks, that's it. Thank you guys very much for joining me here this Wednesday evening. I appreciate it. As always, appreciate uh, Jim Downpour from The Loop at Loop Insight joining me. We're going to talk next week about Apple's 40th anniversary and the 50th anniversary of Mac OS X. If you have any Mac OS X horror stories or things like that, send them off to me. Uh, email sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. Whether you're listening in live in the show, whether you're tuning into the archive, I always appreciate any of you guys who are tuning into the show. So thank you guys personally very much for joining me here on the show. Until next week, as always, I've been Sean King, and you've been listening to Your Mac Life. See ya! <laughs>